a reading of Beowulf and Grendel. The poem tells of Hrothgar, a Danish king who reigns during a time of prosperity. He builds a feasting hall called Hierorot, where his warriors can hold celebrations and listen to songs. The noise emanating from Hierorot infuriates a monstrous demon named Grendel, who is the antagonist of this poem. Grendel subsequently rampages through the kingdom for 12 years, slaughtering Danes and defying all their attempts to subdue his treachery. News of the Danish predicament reaches Beowulf, a young Gidish warrior whose father had once received a feather from Hothgar. Beowulf sails to Denmark, armed with a small group of warriors, prepared to defeat the monstrous Grendel. Hrothgar receives him warmly and holds a great feast at Hirorat to honor Beowulf. During that feast, the Geat boasts of his former accomplishments to answer and challenge posed by Unferth, one of the Danes. The, the excerpt here begins when Hrothgar departs from Hirorat and leaves Beowulf awaiting Grendel's attack. Hrothgar departed then with his house guard, the Lord of Shieldings, their shelter in war, left the mead hall to lie, to lie with Welthiau, his queen and bedmate. The king of glory, as people learned, had posted a lookout who was a match for Grendel, a guard against monsters, special protection to the Danish prince. And the geek placed complete trust in his strength of limb and the Lord's favor. Hand to remove his iron breast mail, took off the helmet, and handed his attendant the pattern sword, a smith's masterpiece, ordering him to keep the equipment guarded. And before he bedded down, Beowulf, that prince of goodness, proudly asserted, when it comes to fighting, I count myself as dangerous, dangerous as any day as Grendel. So it won't be a cutting edge I'll wield to mow him down, easily as I might. He has no idea of the arts of war, of shield or sword play, although he does possess a wild strength. No weapons, therefore, for either this night. Unarmed he shall face me, if he face me he dares. And may the divine Lord in his wisdom grant the glory of victory to whichever side he sees fit. Then down the brave man lay with his bolster under his head and his whole company of sea rovers at rest beside him. None of them expected he would ever see his homeland again or get back up to his native place and the people who reared him. They knew too well the way it was before, how often the Danes had fallen prey to death in the mead hall. But the Lord was leaving a victory on his war loom for the weather geeks. For the strength of one, they all prevailed. They would crush their enemy and come through in triumph and gladness. The truth is clear. Almighty God rules over mankind and always has. Then out of the night came the shadow stalkers, stealthy and swift. The hall guards were slack to sleep at their posts, all except one. It was a widely understood, it was widely understood that as long as God disallowed it, the fiend could not bear them to his shadow born. One man, however, was in fighting mood, awake and on edge, spoiling for action. And off the moors, down the mist bands, God cursed Grendel came greedily loping. The bane of the race of men roamed forth, hunting for a prey in the high hall. Under the cloud murk, he moved towards it until it shone above him a sheer keep of fortified gold. Nor was that the first time he had scouted the grounds of Hrothgar's dwelling, although never in his life before or since did he find harder fortune or hall defenders. Spurned and joyless, he journeyed on ahead and arrived at the bond. The iron braced door turned on its hinge when his hands touched it. Then his rage boiled over. He ripped open the mouth of the building, maddening for blood, pacing the length of the pattern floor with his loathsome tread, while a baleful light, flamed more than light, flared from his eyes. He saw many men in the mansion sleeping, 
a rank company of kinsmen and warriors quartered together, and his glee was demonic, picturing the mayhem. Before morning, he would rip life from limb and devour them, eat on their flesh. But his fate that night was due to change. His days of ravening had to come to an end. Mighty and canny, Hygelic's kinsman was keenly watching for the first move the monster would make. Nor did the creature keep him from waiting, but struck suddenly and started in. He grabbed and mauled a man on his bench, bit into his bone lappings, bolted down his blood, and gorged on him in lumps, leaving the body utterly lifeless, eaten up hand and foot. Venturing closer, his talon was raised to attack Beowulf, where he lay on the bed. He was bearing it within with, an o with open claw when the alert hero's comeback and arm block forestalled him utterly. The captain of evil discovered himself in a hand grip harder than anything he had ever encountered in any man on the face of the earth. Every bone in his body quailed and recoiled, but he could not escape. He was desperate to flee to his den and hide with the devil's litter, for in all his days he had never claimed or cornered like this. Then Hygelec's trusty retainer recalled his bedtime speech, which sprang to his feet and got a firm hold. Fingers were bursting, the monster backtracking, the man overpowering. The dread of the land was desperate to escape, to take a roundabout road and flee to his lair and in the fens. The latching power in his fingers weakened. It was the worst trip the terror monger had taken to Hirarath. And now the timbers trembled and sang, a hall session that harrowed every dane inside the stockade. Stumbling in fury, the two contenders crashed through the building. The hall clamored and hammered, but somehow survived the onslaught and kept standing. It was handsomely structured, a sturdy frame braced with the best blacksmith's work, inside and out. The story goes that as the pair struggled, knee benches were smashed and sprung off the floor, gold fittings and all. Before then, no shield, uh, shielding elder would believe there was any power or person upon earth capable of wrecking their horn-rigged hall unless the burning embrace of a fire engulfed in flame. Then, an extraordinary, an extraordinary wail arose, and bewildering fear came over the Danes. Everyone felt it, who heard that cry as it echoed off the wall. A god-cursed scream and strain of catastrophe, the howl of the loser, the lament of the helser, keening his wound. He was overwhelmed, manacled tight by the man who of all men were, was foremost the strongest in the days of this life. But the Earl Tripp's leader was not inclined to allow his collar to depart alive. He did not consider that life much account to anyone anywhere. Time and again, Beowulf's warriors worked to defend their lord's life, laying about them as best they could with their ancestral blades. Stalwart in action, they kept striking out every, on every side, seeking to cut straight to the soul. When they joined the struggle, there was something they could not have known at the time, that no blade on earth, no blacksmith's art could ever damage their demon opponent. He had conjured the harm from cutting edge of every weapon. But his going away out of this world and the days of his life would be agony to him, and his alien spirit would travel far into fiends keeping. Then, he who had harrowed the hearts of men with pain and affliction in former times and had given offense also to God, found that his bodily powers failed him. Hygelic's kinsmen kept him helplessly locked in a hand grip. As long as either lived, he was hateful to the other. The monstrous whole body was in pain. A tremendous wound appeared on his shoulder. Sinews split and the bone lappings burst. Beowulf was granted the glory of winning. Grendel was driven under the fen banks, fatally hurt to his desolate lair. His days were num numbered. The end of his life was coming over him. He knew it for certain, and one bloody clash had fulfilled the dearest wishes of the Danes. 
The man who had lately landed among them, proud and sure, had purged the hall, kept it from harm, was happy with his night work. And the courage he had shown. The geek captain had boldly fulfilled his boast to the Danes. He had healed and relieved a huge distress, unremitting humili humiliations, a hard fate they'd been forced to undergo, no small affliction. Clear proof of this could be seen in the hand of the, the hero displayed high up near the roof, the whole of Grendel's shoulder and arm, his awesome grasp. Then morning came, and many a warrior gathered, as I've heard, around the gift hall, clan chiefs flocking from far and near, down wide-ranging roads, wondering greatly at the monstrous footprints, his fatal departure, who was regretted by no one who witnessed his trail. The ignominious marks of his flight were where he skulked by, exhausted in spirit and beaten in battle, bloodying the bath, hauling his doom to the demon's mirror. The, the bloodshot water wallowed and surged, there were, were loathsome upthrows and overturnings of waves and gore and wounds slurry. With his death upon him, he had dived deep into his marsh den, drowned out his life and his heathen soul. Hell claimed him there. Then away they rode, the old retainers, with many a young man following after a troop of ho on horseback and high spirits on their bay steed. Beowulf's doings were praised over and over again. Nowhere, they said, north or south, between two seas or under the tall sky, on the broad earth, was there anyone better to raise a shield or to rule a kingdom. Yet there was no lane of blame on their lord, the noble Hrothgar. He was a good king.